early coordination is something that's often talked about with mass timber, but sometimes those conversations can lack clarity. What exactly needs to be modeled? Who owns the model? How are they putting that information into the model? And then how is that information being communicated to fabrication and job sites? Well, hey folks, Ricky McLean with Woodworks here back for yet another edition of Timber Talk Tuesday. Have you ever heard of the phrase constructing a digital twin? We often use this phrase when talking about mass timber projects, specifically the early design coordination phases, getting all of the information as, as much as possible anyways into a 3D building model. Now, 3D building models are not something new. We've been using them for quite some time in building design and construction. However, traditionally, the reason that we were constructing building 3D models was for clash detection to make sure that we're avoiding issues, say, with the ductwork interfering with a structural steel beam. You are still doing those things with a 3D model for mass timber, but it's more than that. It's making sure that you're coordinating things like connections, like through penetrations for plumbing lines, ductwork, sprinkler lines, conduit. And, and making sure that all of those things are then passed on to the fabricator so that when they fabricate the glue lamb beams and columns, the mass timber panels, those openings can be drilled and cut appropriately. Now, I recently had a chance to discuss this very topic with Josh Miller. Josh is a digital construct and practice manager with Keller Pacific, and he works with both fabricators and contractors in helping develop these 3D models for mass timber projects. So in this conversation, we talk quite a bit about the different levels of information that can be modeled for mass timber projects, what is appropriate, and ultimately how does that information get transferred to the fabricator and to the job site. So I'll get right out of the way. Let's move over to that conversation with Josh Miller on the topic of 3D models for mass timber projects. <music> All right, Josh, well, thanks for joining me today. First point of discussion I'd like to have is regarding this model, how do you determine what's the most appropriate level of detail that you can build into a model? I'm sure there's a range of options. Uh, how do you determine that for a given project? Yeah, so it really, it, it kind of depends on, um, you know, your level of risk, you know, where you'd like to mitigate risk on a project, where you'd like to do the pre-planning um, and where you would not like to do the pre-planning. Um, I have some specific examples. Um, so, you know, most often on a project, we'll see, um, you know, the contractor will want to pre-coordinate all the MEPF penetrations on a project. So we kind of start with the larger diameter opening. So anything greater than six inches in, in diameter or if it's a square opening, six inches square, we'll start, we'll start by pinning down those larger penetrations and then moving down, um, you know, to the smaller ones. We, we typically only go as far as three quarters of an inch on a project. I don't think I've, I've seen anything smaller than three quarters of an inch, um, you know, in my career. Um, and then it really, it really depends on um, determining if a system can be pre-planned and pre-fabricated. So on, on, I've been on some projects where there were Simpson hold down connectors and they were bolted through the CLT diaphragm with a through bolt. And I was on this project where the contractor wanted to pre-coordinate all of those through bolt connections of the CLT panels, you know, and there were hundreds of them. Mm. But it it ultimately came down to a, a schedule conflict because the the it was a prefabricated wall system, and all of those shop drawings weren't weren't due to be complete until several months after the CLT needed to go into production. So I think that kind of illustrates something in terms of schedule. So you you can do anything you can pre-plan and prefabricate anything on a project if you have time so it it ultimately comes down to how you're how you're structuring your schedule if you can get your mechanical electrical plumbing and fire protection trade partners on very early get the modeling very early and getting those penetration locations established then that's ultimately going to determine how many of those penetrations you can put into a project so that's the other recommendation i would have is to determining what you want to pre-coordinate and how much time it's going to take and, and setting up your schedule so that you're not lagging your best timber submittal and you're not pushing back your fabrication window because you're trying to coordinate, you know, a hundred three quarter inch diameter drillings that could be done in the field, you know, if necessary. You could include a lot of different things in a model, yeah. um, you know, coming from a lot of different design trades 
uh, or design, you know, practices feeding into a lot of sub trades on sites on site, which kind of begs then the next question, who ultimately is kind of at the core of, of this model? Like who's, who owns the model, if you want to say it that way, who's, who's responsible for making sure that there's this coordination from the design and the, the construction side of things. Sure. So, so ultimately the, ultimately I think the responsibility falls on the general contractor, obviously, but then they, um, you know, if they, if they bring on a specialty contractor to do the timber framing, then they mitigate that or not mitigate, but they delegate that responsibility to that subcontractor. And then a lot of times the subcontractor, when they bring on their fabricator, will delegate the responsibility of designing the structure and doing the modeling to the, to the fabricator. Um, but ultimately, I think the main, the, I mean, everybody shares the responsibility, the responsibility ultimately. And it's, it, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the model and the drawings go through all of these different channels to, to be approved. You know, the, if the fabricator is doing the modeling, they'll submit that to the subcontractor who then reviews it who submits it to the general contractor and then that goes to the design team for review. And that might, you know, that usually happens two times at least on a project. So we, we've built this model. We've, we've used that during the design process. We've fed that information to the fabricator. Now things start arriving to site. The master materials, the installers are on site. What level of digital model uh, integration is still happening on site? Is that where we're starting to see more more people on site with iPads, or is it kind of reverting all back to you know the two D plan set and the job site trailer like we're used to seeing? Yeah, so some of, some of our partners work with programs like Synchro or even Navisworks, and they'll link their construction schedule to the model. So we'll we will put parameters into our model for sequence ID, so the contractor can actually use that to uh, create a four D schedule, and that's displayed you know, in the job trailer, in the job office, um, you know, a, a day by day, what's what's being installed today, you know, what's the next piece that needs to go up. Um, you know, ultimately paper drawings are still being used. Um, I wouldn't say the shop drawings necessarily are being used in the field, more, more so uh, a layout drawing package. So when we put together a, a drawing package, we'll have plan views, elevation views, section views, and then the single piece shop drawings. And so the, the contractors are primarily using the layout drawings which are the plan views, the elevation views, and the sections. And the shop drawings um, are basically just used for QA, QC. So when a piece comes to site, um, the contractor is using the, the single piece shop drawings to look at each individual piece to make sure it's been cut and fabricated correctly. Uh, but ultimately, you know, that, that responsibility lies in the fabricator. And, I, you know, the contractors don't usually get out the full set until something's wrong and they want to figure out what happened. Um, yeah, in, in terms of like using iPads and smartphones on a project, so we, we use um, uh, Autodesk Revit to do all of our detailing. So we use the Autodesk Construction Cloud. So all, our model is hosted in the cloud. All of our shop drawings and layout drawings are there. And then that has a, um, you know, a mobile, a mobile application. Um, and then, you know, that can be used for, for punch box and QAQC, even scanning pieces with QR codes into the project you know, for receiving. I think this is a super interesting topic as more and more people get involved in mass timber. I think learning not just about how do you design a mass timber building and construct a mass timber building, but how do you do that all digitally before anything gets to the job site is, is really key to the success of mass timber projects. Um, so thank you very much for your insights today on this topic. Absolutely. Thanks, Ricky. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Josh. I do think that early design, early coordination is something that's often talked about with Mass Timber, but sometimes those conversations can lack clarity. What exactly needs to be modeled? Who owns the model? How are they putting that information into the model? And then how is that information being communicated to fabrication and job site? So hopefully today's discussion helps clarify some of these topics and at least makes you think about them as you consider your next mass timber project. Well, that's it for today's video. I thank you so much for watching and until next time, we'll see you later.